So we've been uh, in a series here called When God Speaks, God Creates. Everybody say that with me. When God Speaks, God Creates. The second part to that is this. It's when God is speaking, God is creating. So let's put those two together. When God speaks, God creates. And when God is creating, He is speaking. Now take a moment and just kind of process through that. When God speaks, God creates. So everything that God spoke into existence. You go from Genesis chapter 1 and you move into Romans chapter 1. And God says, since the beginning, I have been revealing myself to you through those things that I have created. So when God speaks, God creates. And when God is creating, God is speaking. So uh, as we kind of unpacked these last few weeks, the whole idea of God speaking and creating and God creating and speaking, we came upon something that you cannot, that's inseparable, and that is what God speaks and what God does. What God speaks and what God does. The Scripture says that God doesn't ever break promises. If He makes a promise, He will fulfill it. If God gives His word or speaks His word, it will always come to pass. How many of you hearing me today? So there's this connection between, between God's speaking and God's doing. If He's speaking, He's creating, right? And if He's creating, He's speaking. That process is what God does. It's not who He is, but it's what God does. That's God's process. He speaks, He creates. He creates, He speaks. That's what God does. That's God's process for us. And in that, we thought it was really important for us to talk about two particular words in Scripture that are significant to the idea of God speaking and God creating. And the first word was just a couple of weeks ago was a Hebrew word called hased. Okay, the transliteration would be H-E-S-E-D, H-E-S-E-D, and it's pronounced just simply hased. And in Hebrew, uh, the emphasis on syllables are always the last syllable of a particular word. Whereas in English, you'll find most of it is reversed. You say an English word, most of the time our emphasis, in, our emphasis on a syllable is usually either first or middle of a word. But in Hebrew, almost all the time, the emphasis on a syllable would be that last syllable of the word. So you say hased, the emphasis on the last syllable, okay? Another interesting thing about that language as well is that nouns are always before adjectives, whereas in English it's just the reverse, right? So if I said to you in Hebrew, if I said yom nefla, all I'm really saying to you is a day wonderful, okay? But it's an idiom, and so what they're really saying is have a nice or have a wonderful day. So the nouns are always before the adjectives. So I'm saying all that to say this. This is why it's significant. That the hased simply means that God makes covenant that is everlasting to everlasting. God makes covenant with man that is everlasting to everlasting. His unfailing love is everlasting to everlasting. His mercies, whatever God is, it's unfailing and it's eternal. How many of you are hearing me? Whatever God is, whoever He is, it is eternal. It'll never end. It was before all beginnings and it's after, say it with me, it's after all endings, right? The second word that we looked at was shalom. And so today, you know, trying to connect to the sermon, to the teaching, I came out and I said, hey, good morning, reunion, shalom, you know, and then we got a little, our little fun thing of, okay, is this a, a greeting, is this a salutation, or is this just warm wishes, or trying to check in the temperature on how you're doing in life, is all well, it is well. We sing that song, it, sing it, it is well with my soul. We could be saying, I am at peace, my soul, it is well. My soul is at peace, right? Same thing. We're looking, we've been looking at this word shalom. 
So last week, for everybody that wasn't here, which is about half of you, I don't know where the other half went today. I don't want to go back and I don't want to reteach all of that, but I want to start kind of somewhere where we left off last week with just a small little portion, a little portion of, uh, of review. Before I do that, uh, I wanted to just uh, throw out just a little bit of information about what's going to be happening here next Sunday at 9 o'clock. So next Sunday at 9 o'clock, we begin two new equip classes. And I have to tell you this, that the equip classes are really at the heartbeat, really the heartbeat. Our prayer ministry and our equip ministry are really at the heartbeat of this community. So next Sunday, we begin two new classes. Uh, Paula Walbear, so Paula, would you stand quickly, please? Paula Walbear is going to be teaching a class next week on uh, prayer, yes? Spiritual formation. spiritual formation and prayer, yes? You can't form spiritually without praying, so it's about prayer as well at 9 a.m. And then, um, Miss Vicki, if you'll stand, please. Wow. Good morning there. Beautiful. Yeah. She is starting a class next Sunday called The Grid of Truth. And uh, for those of you that are interested, if you want to get ahead and buy the book that goes to the class, you can do that. Uh, all you need to do is find Summer Casillas somewhere, and, and she'll sell you one of those books for next week. So those begin next Sunday at 9 a.m. So I encourage you to get involved in a 9 a.m. class and, uh, because they really, truly, as I said, uh, represent the heart, heartbeat of, of what we're doing at Reunion. So let's look at the word shalom just for a moment, the word shalom. Now, it's a six-letter word in transliteration or translated into an English form where we can understand it. But in Hebrew, it's a four-letter word. And last week, um, Ashley, if you're there, can you pull up the slide um, that breaks down the word shalom um, where it just has the letter? There it is, okay. So what you see up there is a Hebrew breakdown of the word shalom. And if you're reading Hebrew, you're le reading from the right to the left and not left to the right like we do in English, okay? So that first letter that you see on the screen, it kind of looks like a half of a menorah <laughs> or a weird looking W. That's called shin, 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 okay? And it means destroy or overtake. Destroy or overtake, all right? The first letter of shalom is shin, shin. The second one is lamet, lamet, okay? Lamet, it kind of looks like an ear, you know, a little bit, drawn like an ear. And lamed means control or authority, control or authority. So you got two letters. The first one is sheen, and it means destroy or overtake. The second letter in shalom, okay, is lamed, and it means authority or control, that which controls or has authority over. The third letter is Vav, and it looks just kind of like our capital I with a little flare on the left of it, okay? It's Vav, and Vav means adds or secures or establishes. It secures or sets in motion or establishes. And then the last letter of Shalom in Hebrew is uh, uh, Mim Sofet, okay? And uh, there's a letter that's called meme, and there's a version, a version of it, and that's, that's, we're not chasing that. We're just going to look at it as meme sofit, and meme sofit means chaos, chaos. It kind of looks like a little box, all right? So you have four letters, shin, lamet, vav, and meme sofit, all right? And it means this. If you take the word shalom, which we know it to mean, the Hebrew word for shalom means not hello, goodbye in this context. What does it mean? Say it out loud. Peace. Let's try it all together. Peace. Let's try it out loud. Peace. Yeah. Shalom. Peace. Here's the remarkable reality, and we talked about this last week. I thought it was worth mentioning again today. The remarkable reality about the ancient or biblical Hebrew is this, that using this process of gematria or, uh, you know, the ancient Hebraic language, which is alphanumeric. It has a number and a, a letter and a number numeric value to it. The word shalom means this. God's peace destroys the authority that establishes chaos. 
Now think about that for a moment. You're saying to someone, you're saying to someone, mashlimha, okay? That's to a male. Mashlamek, that's to a female. What you're saying to them is, are you at peace? Are you at peace? Shalom. Are you at peace? Is it well with you? Are you at peace? Or are you truly someone who is overtaken by the chaos, the hostility, and the hatred of our world's culture? And we can let circumstances of our life in difficulty, and boy, some of us have had to face some difficult circumstances. How many of you would say, hey, Pastor Steve, I'm going to be the first one to just raise my hand and just be honest about this. Man, I have faced, I've faced some, some difficulty in life, and it's caused a lot of chaos. It's caused us a lot of hostility, a lot of divide, and a lot of hurt. If that's you, just raise your hand. Now, just so you know, I'm raising my hand as well. And I'd like to say that, oh, man, none of it was my fault. But as I truly look back at it, Jeremy, I look back at it, I have, if I'm going to be 100% honest, and I, I would think that most of you want your pastor to be 100% honest, you know, just like I want you to tie 10%, I want you to be 100% honest. How many of you hear what I'm saying today? To be 100% honest with you, I have to say that much of the chaos, much of the hostility, much of the divide, much of the hurt that I've experienced in my life is self-inflicted. And I know that I'm probably the only one in the room. Yeah? But the reality of it is, is that we find that most of us have caused quite a bit of chaos for not only ourselves, but the people that we love most. How are you hearing me? Now here's the amazing thing about this, is that God's peace destroys the authority that establishes chaos. How does that connect with us in the practical day-to-day -day of living, loving, and walking by faith? So Pastor Steve, just tell me something today in all of your little you know, pseudo-Hebrew lesson that you've given. Tell me something today that helps me live, love, and walk by faith in a better way. Well, here's your answer. All of us who believe in Christ Jesus, all of us who believe in Yeshua can access the shalom, the peace of God in Christ Jesus, which destroys and overcomes the author of chaos and hostility in our lives. All of us. We have to make a choice. Do I choose to continue to live in chaos and hostility in my personal relationships, in my family? Some of our worst hostility is within our own crew. How many of you know that's true? Look, I, I, am I talking to the right people here today? Some of, our, some of our biggest chaos and greatest hostility is within our own household, yes? It's there. And we've experienced it. And then it extends beyond friendships, work relationships. At what point are you and I going to get tired of living in chaos, living in hostility, living in hurt, living in divisiveness, division, separation, opposition. Everybody's tracking with me, say amen. amen. At what point do we become tired enough to say to God, I surrender and I receive your hased, your covenant, eternal covenant, your hased, I receive your covenant to me to bring peace over my life because you have the authority over the author of hostility and chaos in this world. God speaks peace and chaos ceases. God speaks peace and storms cease. God speaks shalom, peace, and the dividing wall of hostility is destroyed 
and you and I can live together in right and righteous relationship. How are we going to fix things at home, Pastor Steve? We're just so dug in. We're just so set in our ways. Who am I talking to today? Do we always have to be in conflict with everybody? Does there always have to be drama? How relevant is that? I don't need to say that in Hebrew. Let me just say it in English. Do we always have to be in the middle of drama? But it seems like there we are, yes? We're always in conflict with somebody, whether it's over politics, whether it's over work, whether it's over responsibilities at home, whether it's over parenting, whether it's over finances, whether it's over fill in the blank. Say it out loud to you. Say it. What is it? What is it, what is it that causes all the conflict in your life? Finances. Raising kids. Is that kind of like raising Cain? Yeah. I, I'm in conflict over my own will and ego, right? Anybody else? Fill in the blank. Come on. I can't hear it. Loss, grief. Yeah, now I heard it. Thank you. Yeah, you got to remember. I'm old too. Um, those are powerful, yes? Loss, grief, our own will versus God's will. Raising kids, that's a difficulty. One parent wants to parent one way, the other one wants to parent the other way. One parent wants to be the friend. Well, mom and I, we're in the friend zone, right? right? While the other becomes the disciplinarian. How many of you know that doesn't always work out? Yeah, you set one parent up for this. You set one parent up for one, the kids to be afraid of one of the parents and the other one gets to be the buddy and the friend. All right? There is no peace. There is no shalom in that situation. Everybody still with me? Say amen. So listen to this, all of us who believe in Christ Jesus can access the shalom, the peace of God in Christ, which destroys and overcomes the author of chaos and hostility. And it gets better from there. His eternal hased, his everlasting covenant, unfailing love, God has promised a peace to his people that defies circumstances that are dictated by chaos and hostility. It's peace in the storm, if you will, okay? Here's a couple of scriptures, and I think I may have shared these last week, but let's go through them again real quickly. Numbers 25, 12, therefore tell him I am making my covenant of peace, which is everlasting. God doesn't make covenants that are, you know, they're eternal, right? God loves you. That's eternal. Isaiah 54, 10, though the mountains be shaken and the hills be removed, yet my unfailing love for you will not be shaken, nor my covenant of peace be removed, says the Lord. Ezekiel 34, 25, I will make a covenant of peace with them and rid the land of savage beasts so they may live in the wilderness and sleep in the forest in safety. Ezekiel 37, 26, I will make a covenant of peace with them. It will be an everlasting covenant. I will establish them and increase their numbers and I will put my sanctuary, my presence, I will put my presence among them forever. Okay? Let's just look at a a last couple bit of definitions over this word shalom because I really want us to have more than just a sense. I want us to have something solid. The shalom of God in Christ Jesus. At rest. Everybody say that. At rest. Content. Content. And and not in in a, a, a wrong way like, hey, I'm... I'm satisfied, I'm content. No, content. The scripture says that we should find contentment. Contentment. Oneness. Peace. Solitude. Calmness. Again, all these definitions point to a promised state of mind and of body and of spirit. How many of you are like me in this sense? That if something's if something's out of sorts, 
then everything's out of sorts. Now, I know it's not everybody, but how many, I just, I'm kind of interested. I'm just taking a personal poll right now. <laughs> how many of you are like me in this sense? That, hey, there's this thing's wrong, so now everything's wrong. And the truth of the matter is if I want to fix everything, all I got to do is fix the one thing. But I can't fix it. Do you understand what I'm saying? I can't always fix everything. And there we find ourselves in this, these spots and these places where there's just no, there's no calmness, there's no contentment, there's no rest, there's no, there's no peace. All, right? All is at rest. It's mind, it's body, it's spirit. If my mind is troubled, it impacts my body physically. Anybody in this room ever f- experienced any of that? If my, if, I've got, I've, if my mind is troubled, right? I have a troubled, my mind is troubled. It impacts me physically. Yeah? Now am I talking about things that are real? Yeah. We got trouble going on. Nobody's getting along in this house. Now you're probably talking about physically, now you're starting to feel symptoms, symptomatic of what's going on in a troubled mind. Am I wrong in this? Because I know in reality that most of the people that I talk and ask me to pray for, hey, pray because I'm struggling, you know, I've I've got stomach issues going, I'm anxious. Where does that anxiety, where's the root of it? We can treat symptoms, but we have to look at root causes. It is when we have no shalom, when we have no peace. The shalom of God through Christ Jesus. Everybody that's still awake, say amen. Amen. So shalom that God by his word pours into his people, this wholeness, this contentment, this welfare, this security, this love, this goodwill with others, and right and righteous relationship with God. Jesus most certainly would have used shalom and his comprehensive blessing when he spoke over his disciples. John chapter 14, you will know this passage really well. Say it with me, it's on the screen. Read it with me, please. Peace I leave with you, my peace I give you. I do not give to you as the world gives. Do not let your hearts be troubled and do not be afraid. He is saying to us, Jesus was saying to his disciples, here is what you're going to face. There is going to be trouble coming your way. Don't lose heart. Don't be discouraged. Don't be anxious. What I'm about to give you is not what the world can give you. The world cannot provide peace in the middle of chaos. The world can't be asleep at the bow of the boat when the storm is raging and the boat's ready to capsize and then Jesus steps to the bow of the boat and says, Shalom, peace be still. But God can. God can. God can. This isn't what the world gives. You can't find this in a prescription. Did I just step in it right there? Let me step a little further into it then. Let me put both feet into it. Sometimes what some of us need can't be prescribed. Sometimes we just need the peace of Christ, the shalom of Christ Jesus over our lives. We've allowed ourselves to be caught in a cycle of anxiety, fear, yes? Worry, strife. How do you balance in life when you have so many relationships that are in conflict? Is everybody tracking with me today? We can't, right? And that's why we need the shalom of Christ Jesus. The peace that Jesus imparted to them imparts to us is not just a lack of strife or trouble, it's supernatural. And it's not dependent on our circumstances, but on God's promises and Jesus conquering death on the cross. Did you hear me today? Because of his death and resurrection, believers are forgiven and our relationship with God is restored. No matter what happens in this world, you and I can claim the promise for all eternity. Jesus confirms this when he said in John 16, 
I have told you these things so that in me you may have. I, I can't hear you. Peace. peace. I have told you these things so that in me you may have peace. In this world you will have trouble. But take heart. I have overcome the world. Now, if you listen to the words of Jesus and you go back to our definition of shalom, the first letter, shin, destroys. The second letter, lamed, authority. The third letter, vav, controls. The fourth letter, mim, God's shalom overtakes and overcomes the authorities that bring chaos to our life. And that's why Jesus said, in this world you will have trouble. Because there is an authority that brings chaos into the world. But He said, don't be afraid. I have overcome the world. And I'm telling you this so that in the middle of the chaos, when they start to revile you, when they start to mock you, when they start to undermine Christianity, I'm telling you this so that when the nation that you've paid taxes to and the flag that you've flown over your country and the love that you've had for your nation and for your opportunity to live in one of the greatest countries ever in the history of this world, when that nation turns against the very God that you love and believe in, don't worry about it, you're gonna be okay. I will protect you because I've overcome the chaos that's in this world. No, we would rather fret, we would rather be angry, we would rather be hostile to everyone who doesn't agree with us politically. Stop, 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 stop. Please stop, please stop fighting and striving against one another. The Bible calls you and I to love one another, not to hate one another. The Bible calls you and I to love one another as Christ has loved us. So let's get back to loving and stop fighting. Let's get back to the shalom, the peace of Christ Jesus, and let's live in an existence that we know for certain that the peace of Christ has overcome this world. Amen. Amen. Now, we're wrapping up with this, okay? It's true for us today, just as it was 2,000 years ago when Jesus spoke these words. And consequently, the Apostle Paul, at the beginning of his letters even uh, in the New Testament, he begins them, grace and shalom to you from God our Father, from the Lord Yeshua Messiah. Grace and peace to you from God the Father. Philippians 4, 6, and 9. Do not be anxious. Read it with me. I was gonna ask all the anxious people to stand and read it with me, but that would make us anxious. <laughs> hey, am I right? We'd all be standing. So why don't we just all read it in our outdoor voice? Do not be anxious about anything but in every situation by prayer and petition with thanksgiving, present your request to God. And the peace of God which transcends all understanding will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. Whatever you have learned or received or heard from me or seen in me, put it into practice. And the God of peace will be with you. And the God of peace will be with you. And the God of peace will be with you. One more time. And the God of peace will be with you. Well, Pastor Steve, they don't, my pastor doesn't do that at my church. I'm sorry. 1 Thessalonians 5.23. May God himself, the God of peace, sanctify you through and through. May your whole spirit, soul, and body. Remember me talking a few minutes ago when you were looking at me cross-eyed for a moment? 
when I was making the connection between our mind, our body, and our spirit, and the connection of shalom, the peace of Christ, how he, when the peace of Christ comes to us, that he promises peace for us, mind, body, and spirit. If your mind is troubled, your spirit is troubled. If your mind and spirit are troubled, your body's in trouble. How do you hear what I'm saying? It's holistic. It's holistic. Can you say that with me? It's holistic. It covers it all. He says it right here. May your whole spirit... Am I reading this wrong? No, I, I'm not. May your whole spirit, soul, and body be kept blameless at the coming of our Lord. The only way for us to be like that way is for us to live in the shalom and the peace of the Lord Jesus Christ. I can't remember who, but I read one biblical scholar who wrote God's goal in redemption through Christ is the restoration of what was lost in the fall of mankind. Because the moment that they were asked to leave the garden, there was no peace. Well, it started before that. Because I can tell you one thing. When God was searching for Adam and Eve for their daily walk in the garden together, and he was calling their name, I guarantee you Adam was anxious. There was no shalom. <laughs> he knew. Yes? And it's the same way with you and I. When we are not walking in right relationship with God and with one another, we are anxious and there is no shalom. There is no peace. Remember this, God's covenant of peace will not be removed. It's unmovable. Isaiah 54.10, For the mountains may depart and the hills be removed, but my steadfast love will not depart from you and my covenant of peace will not be removed, says the Lord. It doesn't matter what goes on in our crazy world. God's covenant of peace will not be removed from us. I shared with you last week my conversation with uh, an academic counselor in, living in the city of Tel Aviv. And she was asking and inquiring about all of our you know, hurricane victims on the east, southeast coast and all the terrible, terrible and horrible things that these people are navigating there. I mean, it's, it's, it's devastation, right? And yet I'm listening to a person who hasn't even said one thing to me about what's going on where she lives. And finally I says to her, I said, yes, thank you for your compassion and your concern over all these people. And it's difficult, you know, and people are trying to do all they can to help help their neighbors and help people and they get through it. I said, but you know, your situation there is probably, if not uh, equally as terrible and chaotic and hostile as the one here. I mean, you're liv she's living in a city that in a 12 hour span they had to send out over 100 anti-missile aircraft just to stop the city from being completely blown apart and devastated. And yet she's on the phone talking with me about, you know, my Hebrew classes and, uh, you know, when I'm going to start my, you know, school and, and asking about hurricane victims in the U.S. How does a person have that kind of shalom? in the middle of that kind of chaos and anxiety. Did you hear that little, like, breath of air that just went through the room? That was what happens when I close my notebook. <laughs> that reunion. Is. Some people like to say it's a sigh of relief from everyone, and I like to look at it as the breath of the Spirit. I would love to be able to stand up here and tell you and your families, all of you, that over the next 17 days, it's all going to be good. 
I'd also like to stand up and tell you, hey, after on day 18, after our national election, it's all going to be, it's great. Your, your, your family's going to thrive. Things are going to be awesome. But I'd, what I'd rather tell you is I'd rather tell you something that's true. That on November 7th, you and I will wake up and we will give glory to God, right. our Father, <laughs> Creator of heaven and earth. The God that breathed the breath of life into mankind, to humankind, is still breathing over you and I. And we will be okay. We will be okay. Part of having relationships with people in third world countries allows me kind of a front row seat and an inside knowledge of I've had friends in Zimbabwe, in Uganda, and around the world whose nations, whose countries have gone through horrific political upheaval and elections. One of the elections that was held this past year in Zimbabwe, and it did not go the way the, the, people, the people wanted. It went, it went against them. The corruption that's taking place in the government of Zimbabwe is horrific in their country and its resources and its wealth are being turned over to the nation of China while the people suffer. And I know that the people, the Christian people there were praying for the election to go in a way that they would have been felt favorable. How many would agree? Just like we got people here praying, we want it to go this certain way, you know? But if it doesn't go the way you prayed, it doesn't mean that God hasn't heard you. Step back. You and I have got to stop filtering this world and God and His plans for this world through the ideology of a Western civilization. We are no longer entitled to anything, but we are promised everything through Christ Jesus. Amen. He has given us His everlasting covenant. My peace I give you. My peace I leave you. Not as the world gives. Not as the world gives. Are you here today? And this is the one thing that is out of your reach. You can't seem to find that place of shalom, that place of peace. I'm a bit of an old school guy. And I'm not apologizing for it. I'm kind of glad I am. And I like to wear tennis shoes to church still, but I'm an old school guy. Um, I'd like to pray over you if, you if you would be willing or courageous enough to stand, just stand up. If that shalom or that place of peace is the thing that's just been avoiding, just out of your reach, just stand. And we're not standing just because someone else is standing. We're standing because I asked you a question. My question to you once again is this. Is that place of shalom, that place of peace, is it just seemed to be out of your reach? And so you stood. So Father, in the name of your Son, Jesus, who speaks peace, who speaks to the winds and the waves, peace be still. Your word says that you are our peace that tears down the wall of hostility in us. For every one of these wonderful people and friends who have stood today, I pray, Lord God, I 
I pray, Lord God, that you would bring to them that which has been just out of their grasp and just out of their reach. I pray for the peace, the shalom of Christ. I pray for you to speak over their life. Let it be so. Just ask you to do me a favor. Just extend your hands just straight out. Not above your head. I'm not asking you to do anything weird. I just want you to reach your hands just straight out with your palms up just here. It's kind of like a symbol of receiving. I'm holding my hands out in a way that would say, God, I'm, I'm receiving this from you today. I receive your peace. Those of you that are seated, will you do me a favor? Will you pray right now for these people whose hands are extended? Just pray for them. Shalom. Shalom, shalom. 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 God destroys the authority that controls chaos over your life. Every bit of chaos, every bit of crisis, every bit of anxiety, every bit of unrest. Let it just slip out. Let it just slip out today. Just let it slip out and away from you. Can I say this to you? You don't have to live with it anymore. It'll still be around, but it doesn't have to control you anymore. It doesn't have to ruin you anymore. It doesn't have to rule you anymore. Your ruler and your king is the Prince of Peace. Sarshalom, Sarshalom. Isaiah said, Prince of Peace. Say it with me. Prince of Peace. One more time, Prince of Peace. Be the ruler of my heart. Oh, come on, one more time. Prince of Peace. Be the ruler of my heart. Sarshalom. In the name of Jesus, amen. Let's give God praise today.